one of the reasons I really respect and read almost everything that uh, that Ben puts out is that um, not just because he's right most of the time, most. Uh, but but because he also comes with it. <laughs> um, let's say I just don't remember any time he's been wrong, um, but I'm assuming. Um, so, but Benedict has also been uh, trained as a historian, and I really appreciate that. I'd always like to think about you know, what history can teach us when, it's, when it comes to, well, anything actually, not just technology. But just let me kick off with this question. You know, how relevant is an understanding of the history of, of if not technology, but just generally speaking, historical on, uh, perspectives on your analysis? Are you using actively, I know you, you sometimes uh, use these uh, details from history as, as, as uh, anecdotes, but do you actually really think about whether history is repeating itself? Yeah, so, I mean, there's a, there's a great quote, for, I think, from Hugh Trevor Roper, who said, history teaches us nothing except that something will happen. Um, and, you know, it, 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 you, can, you can really do too much pattern recognition, but I think it's kind of very helpful to look at something apart from itself and think, well, how do these kinds of things tend to evolve? Um, and what pattern might we see here? Um, and... You know, I mean, I, I, in the sort of current context, I've just sort of published a presentation which has some material about China. And it's sort of fascinating to look at the Chinese industry structure and think, well, is this what would have happened if Yahoo had been run by completely different people? Like, we just sort of presume that the portal model was doomed, and of course it would go to vertical. Um, but in China, that didn't happen. It developed in completely the opposite way. And is that just China, or is it that what we thought was inevitable was actually just kind of the way it happened? Um, and I think it's it's always useful hmm. to kind of to still sort of step back and say, um, you know, what are sort of patterns of things that tend to, to happen here, um, and what are other things that might sort of illuminate what's going on, rather than being sort of right hmm. down um, in the kind of the nitty gritty of what's going to happen next quarter. Um, you know, why is it that Apple lost in the eighties and won in the two thousand tens? You know, what was it that was different hmm. about the PC market and the smartphone market? Exactly. You know, one of the things that strikes me also when I think about history is like we often are 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 seeking a single cause for what events like you, you just pointed this question about Apple. Was there something when often actually humanity is driven by multiple causes, po possibly thousands of causes, and we just don't don't like these complex answers. We don't like the the possibility that. You know, it was a confluence of multiple events that that led us to this to this present, and that that's that's why it's it's I think that this historian has a, such a difficult job because often people look to them for answers when all they can do basically is say, well, many things could have been the reasons. Um, but let's let me just you you mentioned that you just published a new uh a new document a new uh, uh deck on on the sort of the state of the of the world um and you referred in particular to the mm. question of bundling and in general this is a metaphor that's often used in tech analysis you know whether things are bundled and or unbundled um how what let me use that because we believe in the question of transportation, at least I think we in the micromobility community think of it as sort of the car being a bundle mm. and that transportation itself is a bundle. Does that strike you as relevant or does that strike you as completely misguided? Do you think, because obviously we've had the unbundling of computing or communications or media, how does that, how do you think about transportation? So, I mean, I think there's all you know, as a historian, you know, one was sort of plagued by Marxists who want to apply one rule to everything. And I think every rule is sort of, there's this line, I think it was, a, I think an economist line, that every model is wrong, but all models are useful. And they're all sort of different lenses of looking at things that may reveal some some insight into what's going on and what may not. And so there is this sort of sense of, you know, there's bundling and unbundling. You can integrate things or you can break them apart. There is sort of, you know, do you have things that are vertically integrated or horizontally integrated? Do you have client versus server? And you know, the pendulum is always swinging between do you have the, the intelligence in the server or do you have the intelligence in the device and you know, back and forth. And you know, just getting a sense of what might be going on there um, and where might the advantage be is kind of useful. 
Um, I mean, I think you're, you're, you're sort of absolutely right in sort of thinking about Carl's that there are these sort of different puzzles that we're sort of trying to work out in parallel. You know, clearly electric, you know, the fact that lithium ion batteries have gone down in price 90% in the last 10 years, okay, that changes a whole bunch of stuff and makes things possible. Um, so what? Well, what changes exactly? If, if in 20 years' time, we're all driving around in cars that look more or less like cars that we have now, except that they're electric, okay, well, that changes one thing. If we change who owns the car, that might be something else. If the cars somehow drive themselves, it feels like that might change a lot, but that's a lot more speculative. Um, but then there's also, well, what should that car even be? Um, which is kind of to your point, um, should it be something with two seats, four seats, six seats? Um, I was just looking briefly at the Indonesian market where something like 50% of the population is doing ride share, but of course, what, half of the ride share is two wheelers, not four wheelers. So you're summoning a guy on a moped, you're not summoning a, a, a Prius if you're in Jakarta and you need a ride. Mm. Um, and so I think there's a sort of, one of the ways I'm, sorry, I'm being, again, slightly unstructured, but one of the ways I'm thinking about what COVID, the COVID lockdown has done is that it breaks lots of habits. And there's all sorts of stuff that you do because you do. And now you're forced for 18 months not to do any of it. And you ask yourself, why should we do it? And we see that very obviously in like business travel. Mm. You know, why exactly are you getting on a plane once mm. a week? And the same thing, why exactly does a car have to have four wheels and, and six seats and be a certain weight and a certain size? And is there something about electric or something about internet connectivity that changes that? Is there some social change? that triggers that? Is there, some, is there some combination of all of those that might trigger a change in the way we think about it? Right, and these are what, you mentioned these um, lithium batteries and summoning cars or vehicles in general, and these are all enabled in one of the other theses of micromobility is that it's not really an invention. It's not like we have to crack a very difficult puzzle in terms of technology. We're just putting together pieces that have been commoditized over decades, the lithium battery, the cellular phone, the GPS network, and also the uh, you know small motors as, as, as they've become ubiquitous in, in other machines. And sort of these are reassembled in the new configuration and that actually makes it very quick to market. It also makes it quick to iterate, which is one of the benefits I think in computing is that we've had this very, very rapid development and iteration cycle due to the fact that things are obsolete quickly and they have a short lifespan. That's not true of cars in general. Cars tend to linger and they tend to be, um, they tend to have a lifespan and measured in decades and platforms yeah. even longer. Um, and and that and the terrible costs associated with changing anything. So that's one of the things that is hopeful to me as as sort of uh, saying that we should be looking at the small versus the large. But let me pause um, a bit also to ask about um, you mentioned self driving as potentially a game changer. But again, how fast is that going to be? How quick is that going to happen? And is it a winner take all game? What's your take on that? So I think my kind of primary, well, so two basic observations. The first of them is machine learning made people think that, that, that self driving might be possible. Um, but it turns out, of course, that the last 10% is 90% of the effort. Um, so we had kind of a wave of enthusiasm followed by a, yeah, we've gone, made a huge jump forward, but we don't quite know what, how far, how, how hard it is to get the, the last bit to get something that can go anywhere with no steering wheel. Um, early grail. Um, I think the second piece is it feels like this is going to be a where rather than a when question. So we saw Joe Biden say that he wants to move all of the federal US federal cars to electric. And I think you'll see something similar in sort of movements in lumps. So like the garbage truck that can follow the crew down the road, but they have to get at, well, at walking pace, but they have to get in at the end of the road to drive it to the depot. You know, the small town that's um, self-drive only at the weekend but that's a golf cart and you drive to the edge of town and you get into a golf cart but most of the town is pedestrian you know there's many more sort of more fractured models than everything looks like every single pod is exa every there's a pod and it, all the pods are the same and every vehicle use of every possible kind is served by that one pod i think instead you get kind of electric obviously in very kind of varied multimodal ways and you get um autonomy in all sorts of kind of very complex ways. And like you could very easily have um, 
a car that can drive on an America, on, a, on a freeway that can't drive in a city. And you can have a car that can drive in a city that can't drive in Naples. And we're not going to wait until it can drive up a hill in Kathmandu before we do anything. So you have much more kind of limited, constrained, confined rollouts rather than like in the year 2027, you'll be able to buy a car that has no steering wheel. Right. It's it's not that self-driving is is a is a single event or is a single. It, it's going to be a question of applicability in certain contexts. It's going to be uh, potential certain yeah. business models. One of the things that strikes me about my, uh, you know, what, this is another tenet of micro or in general uh, mobility is that there's this thing called Marchetti's constant that we have roughly historically speaking only been spending on average of an hour a day as our time budget for tra travel. Um, and, and that this has been true whether we were walking or using uh, mm. uh, horses or, or trains or, or anything else. And this is, again, it's, it's debatable, but it, there are, there's quite a bit of, of evidence. Um, even today, the average American spends about 55 minutes a day in, in, in their car. Now, is the, is the self-driving therefore really about capturing the attention of the audience while in the car in which case, effectively, you're like saying, well, can we monetize an hour a day, which isn't all that much. I mean, we use our phones more than three hours a day at this point. And I think television is a, at four hours or something like that. So if the one hour is in the inevitable, it may even stretch mm. a bit longer. Well, well so it changes. Um, it does change things. Really... I mean, there's a joke that if you want to believe in autonomy, you should buy alcohol companies and Netflix because um, there's no more drink driving and you can exactly. watch movies in the car. I mean, you, you can kind of put there's all sorts of sort of second order consequences around this that... Um, you know, the sort of the, the sort of the obvious, the first step of autonomy is it's the world looks sort of the same and the world is probably quite mixed and there's lots of manually driven cars as well. So you're commute, you're driving more or less the same distance at more or less the same speed, but you can look at us, you can do something on the way. The second step is, um, OK, what happens at the point that you declare this highway as autonomy only? What does that do to congestion? What does that do to average speed? Maybe you're willing, maybe your commute gets faster. Maybe you're willing to spend longer in the car if you don't have to look at the screen. Um, but on the other hand, of course, maybe you're working. Why would you commute for two hours a day if you can work from home? Um, and that's the sort of the bit that was always kind of ignored mm. in conversations about autonomy. Like, well, maybe you're not going to work anymore anyway. Um, so then you can, you know, then you go to the real sort of sci-fi stuff where you say, well, if all the cars are autonomous, then you can drive at 150 miles an hour and you don't need traffic lights and junctions because you sort of packetize the road network. I don't think anybody thinks that's sort of going to happen in the next decade. You know, maybe that's sort of 20, 30 years away, if, if ever. You know, that's sort of science fiction territory, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, the step one is um, you don't need to look at the road and you don't have crashes, but otherwise, like, stuff looks more or less the same as it does now. Um, and at that point, yeah, like I can work on the way, I can do email on the way to work. That presumes it's like it's like being in a taxi or a limo. I mean, do we really get thrilled by that experience? It's like after five minutes of realizing there's no driver, there's you're going to be bored. There's a great quote and from I think what? Agatha Christie, which I, I sort of I believe it's from her, but I haven't been able to find it. Um, which she said that she could never, when she was growing up, she could never imagine being so poor that she wouldn't have servants. And so rich that she would have a car. <laughs> yeah. And there's a chart yeah, I've yeah, made yeah. that I have not yet found what to do with, which is the number of elevator attendants in America over time. And it's a perfect bell curve. It goes all the way up in a gentle curve till about 1950, and then it goes all the way back down again. And there's now like 10,000 elevator attendants in America, which is basically a doorman in an apartment building. And because of elevate, driving in elevators, I've got this fascinating book called The Social History of Elevators. First observation, an, ele an elevator is public transport. It's privately owned transit system. It's a vertical streetcar. Second observation, until like the 20th century, you drove an elevator. There wasn't a you know, you actually had an accelerator and a brake, and you had to decide when to apply both. Otherwise, you could get people killed. And it was only in the 50s that you actually had a button you would press that would take you to the floor. And then you still have an elevator attendant. So in the, what's that movie? The Apartment with Jack Lemmon. Jack Lemmon is a work clerk at an insurance company, and he's got an electromechanical adding machine. And there's like 5,000 people in the building with an adding machine. So everyone in the building is basically a spreadsheet. Everyone in the building is a cell in a spreadsheet. And the love interest, Shirley MacLaine, is an elevator attendant, which means someone gets in the elevator and says, floor five, please, and she presses the button for five. That's her job. And, you know, it's a long-winded answer, but, like, you look at, like, driving a car, 
that feels like something that should be automated. But if you automate it, then what? What else happens? Then what? Because exactly, we didn't end up with a building full of people that were replaced by, you know, instead of being adding machine operators, they were not replaced by robot adding machine operators. We created the spreadsheet. It was a completely yep. different idea. And this is this is why I'm I'm not incredibly uh, excited about someone spending, uh, you know, uh, half a trillion dollars to solve autonomy in without understanding what comes after right or would they even be the beneficiary of what comes after um as many people who cracked a nut of cellular communications were not the beneficiaries it turned out to be much later with the smartphone companies and the platforms which brings me to my one of the questions i did write down here to I make sure i ask you is that to what extent and you you delve deeply in this to what extent do you think platforms are important here um right now there's there's uh, obviously, the iOS. I, I know you and I were sort of, um, um, let's say, let's say on this on this debate about iOS versus Android, and and you famously wrote that mm. they both won. Um, you know, uh, well, but, won but nonetheless, they uh, they did. Well, Apple won a bit more, yeah, but but ultimately um, they displaced Windows out of the running, and that you know kept Microsoft out of the game which they were very keen mm. on being a part of ever since like 1990s. Um, but still in the, in the mobile um, or the transportation world, how do we just think about platform? Are there platforms? Can you get platform economics? Is the platform scale possible? Because one of the things I, I, I did as an exercise is like, I asked myself, how many customers does BMW have? Because I had a BMW, I have mm. a BMW i3 and you could run apps inside of some, one of the sub menus of one mm. of the, display panels and i was like well how many developers would be amused by this or interested by this and i thought you know I, when i ran the few numbers i said well bmw probably doesn't have more than 25 million users which nobody really cares about in 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 the mobile world that's not a big number so is there a potential for this in micro or otherwise how do we think about this is uber a platform is it ever going to be one is is tesla a platform so i mean there's i think there's a sort of famous thing that someone asked bill gates if so, so bill gates said facebook isn't a platform because the platform has to create more value for other people than it creates for itself um which i'm not quite sure i agree with but i think there's a sort of a fundamental point here is that you're you allow, enable other people to build stuff on top of your thing and thereby it gets better. And there's generally a network effect in that as well, um, which is what in the end, of course, kill, almost killed Apple in the 80s and 90s and then killed, Apple, killed Windows Phone in the 2000s. Um, I mean, my, I tend to think that the smartphone is the universal device and everything else is a smartphone accessory. Um, I mean, in the 80s and 90s, PC was a universal device and everything else, A, everything else was a PC accessory. So like everything else in your home was in some sense, a bit, it was digital, was powered off the PC, like the printer was powered off the PC. And secondly, anything else that you made that you wanted to put computing into, like an ATM or an elevator or a machine tool, had a PC. Like that was, you know, that was how, how you ran a machine tool. There was a PC inside it um, or an ATM. And now obviously that's smartphones. So like a drone is using smartphone components. You know, anything now that you want to put compute into, you use smartphone components, use the smartphone supply chain. And any connected, any intelligent device in your home or, in, you know, is now powered by the smartphone. So like the connected speaker and the doorbell, the fridge or whatever it is that you think makes sense or the thermostat, whatever those devices are, they're all basically slaves to, they're, all, they're powered off the smartphone. Or smartphone accessories um and so that's in the tv as well i mean there was this moment in the 90s when people thought the tv would be the final universal device and then it will be interactive tv and it turned out no it's a smartphone is the universal device and the tv is a smartphone accessory and so i would sort of presume mm. like why would you have like another app platform in the in the tv sorry in the smart in the in the car why wouldn't that just be your smartphone right <laughs> The car, I, I use this phrase once, uh, the car is, feels like a smartphone accessory, and yet it doesn't even have a mounting uh, a bracket. But the other thing is that cars are feature phones. Uh, it, it's, it's, I mean, cars are painfully feature phones in the software yeah. phones. Um, I yeah. mean, there's a great American website I saw on a TV ad on a, at, an H, at, a, at a gas station. So in America, gas pumps have TV ads on the screen. Which is, a, I wonder, yeah. I'd love to know who, who thought of that as a business, so genius. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I saw this ad for, it's a website called My Car Does What. 
which is to explain the 850 different features that the industry has added. So like there's the backup detector and there's the blind spot detector and there's a the rear crossing right backup detector, which are all separate products from separate companies. And the only integration point is they each get their own light on the dashboard. Which is how you get to like two billions line of two billion lines of code in, yeah, exactly. in the car, which is all in yeah, and it's and exactly what like a Nokia looked like in two thousand ten. There's eight hundred and fifty features instead of. I mean, there's this wonderful line by the guy who I can't remember the guy's name. He said to me that um, cars are going from being um, complicated cars with simple software to um, complicated um, to um, simple cars with with, with, with and. You see the inverse. Cars are complicated and they have very basic software, and they will now have very basic. They will now have very sophisticated software, and the, the cars themselves will be very simple, because instead of each of those sensors having their own kind of software and their own integration path and their own vendor and their own buying manager at the car OEM, there's all be dumb sensors that are integrated into the computer, which is of course what Tesla does now. And so in that sense, the platform yeah, is a sensor. It's a computer. It's a platform for Tesla. The question, but the, but the other question is, uh -huh. does that become like a a thing that your Tesla is better than your BMW because all the developers write apps for Teslas. And to, I think it's, I suppose it's possible, but it seems much more likely to me that your car is the TV and everything actually happens on your phone. I mean, not the car stuff, not the, you know, managing the battery, yeah. but like watching movies and music, that stuff that happens on your phone. So how do you feel about a, a let's say not just a car as the accessory but more something smaller something well two two seats maybe you know four wheels maybe three is that is that if these form factors begin to emerge would would we don't let's you, you know even imagine something from apple or something from even uh, amazon for delivery purposes devising these these urban uh, urban pods um could they become platforms in you know it can you know create a new evolutionary path as opposed to what the the car seems to be at the, at the so time? i think there's there's sort of several steps to this because there's the obvious step which is it's sort of a standalone device that is connected to the cloud is connected to an app but it's not extensible in its own right so the second answer may be more interesting is what happens when you have sort of API access to those things. So what happens if um, those Amazon delivery pods become part of AWS, not in a literal sense, but in the sense that like there's an API and I can just plug in um, and do an API call to get delivery. I, do an a I can do an API call to summon a drone to get it to do X and Y and Z. And I don't, you know, I don't know whether what you would call a platform, that a platform or something else. But it does seem to me that there's scope for quite a lot of innovation once those things have software in them. You know, they don't just go from A to B. They could do other things. Um, do they run, you know, do they have a consumer app store? Who knows? You know, we're, we are deep into science fiction here. Um, are they addressable by many different things? That becomes interesting. I mean, one of the, one of the questions about autonomy is what the layers of disaggregation might be because of course this is a big deal for smartphones is that you know it's apple doesn't design the radio and they don't make the thing and they don't make the screen there's nokia made everything but you know apple doesn't make makes almost nothing of what's actually in the iphone um, and so you could sort of propose like this vehicle is manufactured by kawasaki using panasonic batteries um it's got you know a it's running an operating an open source operating system um it is owned by a holding company that's then securitized that money out into the stock exchange. It's operated by Serco, by mm. some you know outsourcing company. Um, it then does real-time bidding for each ride between Uber, Lyft, Line Bike, and something else. And it then goes mm. to a warehouse somewhere in Oakland where yet another company is outsourced to do the cleaning. I basically describe a William Gibson novel. Um, but the point is, like, you can't just sort of presume the pod is just like owned by one mega corp any more than, you know, the, any more than if you look at an Uber, an Uber drive today, it's not a mega corp. You know, it's an Uber app on an Apple smartphone with Google Maps with a car manufactured by a Toyota where most of the components actually come from third party vendors. It's then bought through a leasing company and then run by um, somebody who's an individual contractor. And I would sort of imagine that degree of disaggregation um, in any sort of other ve an, an autonomous vehicle, particularly if you didn't have a human driver. Um, the same thing for a delivery pod. The same. I mean, this is the thing everyone tried to do with, um, with doctor's bikes, doctor's scooters. Can you sort of disaggregate the ownership somehow?
how can you shift the leverage yeah it's it's one thing like you said also when we started this discussion is that we you can't necessarily believe that the 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 future will look like the past especially or repeat in any way but it's going to be it's going to be uh very interesting how, what happens when you when you do deliver on a on a on a different basis of of what a transportation device should be um and and one of the ways we try to capture this is to sort of think about mm. the market for miles and the market for miles as opposed to vehicles and obviously this is what Uber is and Lyft are positioned on. I mean, the, their premise is that people really need to go places. They don't need a box. They, the box is is um, is is a means to. It's an enabler. Um, but in this market for miles, the, the, the challenge there is that if you if you work it out pretty efficiently and due to competitive factors, that really mm. doesn't give you a lot of margin. Um, and you end up with a with a potentially kind of you know commoditized business model, um, and and so one of the ways the smartphone guys survived this, well, Apple in particular, is that they didn't really offer just computation or just communication or just storage. A lot of people thought that's what they did, but they didn't. They're, that's not their business. Um, rather, they they offer experiences some people say delightful things they provide you with a feeling of community perhaps belonging and this is why we said market for miles eventually becomes a market mm. for smiles so the question is do, do you see a way that somebody with the skills of marketing the skills of branding the skills of design brings value to this, what is otherwise a pure utilitarian problem. Sort of so well, there's interesting types. things in, in this. I mean, you know, different people have very different attitudes to cars. Um, you know, different people value different things in their car. Um, otherwise everybody would drive a Prius or, you know, whatever, nobody would, no one would buy a seven series. Um, mm. Different people clearly also value different things in their phones. Um, and you see this in the value of the app ecosystem. You know, people who buy $50 Androids do not spend as much money on apps as people who buy $700 Androids or $700 iPhones. Um, you know, there's sort of self selection within that. People mm. are different. Um, you know, different people value different things, appreciate different things, care in different ways about design versus utility versus price versus, you know, X and Y and Z. And I, you know, I think, you know, I, the, the, the challenge in, in vehicles is who owns the thing, because what happened in PCs in the 80s and, you know, historical analogy was that Apple made this thing and the pitch was it's beautiful and it's easy to use. And it, but the problem was the actual market for PCs was corporate IT managers who wanted a box to connect to, connect to an Oracle database. And so they couldn't give two shits what, how easy it was to use. It was only running a terminal window mm. and they certainly didn't care how pretty it was. What they cared about was how easy is it to open the box and can I buy 10,000 at a price and can I buy 10,000 more at another price next month? And so they didn't give a shit about any of the stuff that Apple was selling. Whereas in 2015, the customer is not a corporate IT manager, it's a consumer who does, does care about all of those things. And so you could sort of say that the product Apple proposed in 1985 and in 2015 was basically trying to do the same thing. It's just the customer was completely different and the customer was right in 2000. It was the right customer in 2015 and the wrong customer in 2005. Um, mm. So who's buying the things? If it's a fleet, if all these autonomous vehicles are bought mm. by a fleet, then they care about durability, about washability, about maintenance and repairing and the cost and the load factor much more than how nice it feels when you shut the door. So that's, I think, a way of answering that question. Um, there's another question that occurs to me, which is actually where I thought you were going with this. And this is also something like a big part of the presentation I've just done is if one thinks about e-commerce, um, a big way, you know, you can think about it as well as books and there's clothes and there's this and there's that. But you can also think about it instead of looking at the category is looking at the logistics model, which is the sort of as it might be two thirds of e-commerce of retail is stuff that can be delivered by a parcel. A book can come in a parcel. Clothes or shoes can come in a parcel. Mm -hmm. um, and about one third is stuff that can't come in a parcel. So groceries furniture, restaurants, and that needs some other mm -hmm. logistics model. And that means either you're going to have to go to the store and get it, or somebody's going to have to bring it to you, like not in a cardboard box, but either on a bike or in a refrigerated truck, which is what grocery delivery looks like, restaurant delivery looks like. Restaurant delivery in the US last year was about 10% of total restaurant spending. 
But it turns out that takeaway in 2019 was like a third to a half of total US restaurant spend. And that's, uh, that's you go to the store and you get it, except it's food. And so if instead of thinking like you're in a person, you're a car, you're driving from A to B, instead you ask, well, what's the objective here? Because, of course, from a retailer's point of view, it's a lot cheaper if your customer will come to you than if you have to take it to your customer. I mean, this is the genius of Amazon, the genius like Walmart. The genius of Walmart is they get you to drive 50 fucking miles to your grocery shop because it's cheaper. Mm. And so they don't need the town center retail and they don't need all the cost associated with that. On the other hand, the, you know, the challenge for Amazon is, well, we've got to ship it to you. So how do we get you to feel like that's a good deal? Um, and the same thing for restaurant delivery, the same thing for all of these. So like, how do you relocate? What is it that should move? Should the person move, the product move? Should the retail move? Where should right. they move from? Well, this is the interesting thing also with, with the narrative about moving from miles to smiles was that maybe transport doesn't really need to do utility anymore. Like you said, stuff is going to come to me anyway. So why would you leave at all? Well, people want to leave for other more, let's say, entertaining reasons. So, um, for example, you know, social, um, uh, discovering new things, adventures, experiences, what we think of today as when mm. we go on vacation. A vacation is an adventure. So people listening to this, vacation now, is when you walk that... out of your home and you get onto this thing called an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. Um, so the, the the whole thing is that, you know, I'm reminded in Las Vegas, for example, I observed how taxis were dropping people off at a um, at an establishment. Um, and I remember that after they dropped off the um, the passengers, they would drive a little forward and somebody would exchange some paperwork with them. And I found out later that they were basically getting a kickback from the establishment for having delivered people, because I guess most people who were going to this establishment were like, just take us to a place that's interesting and the cabbie would make that decision for them. So the, the effectively what I think what makes sense in a new model of post-utility transport is like, hey, the machine should say, or you rather you address the machine to say, hey, take me someplace interesting. And then it decides um, possibly with incentives from the destination mm -hmm. to take you there, which is actually the yep. way the whole Internet works today. We we thought we wanted to go A to B on the Internet, but instead we sort of like, huh, just take me somewhere cool. Um, and, and that's what surfing is. That's what search is. And that's what social media has become. So we be we've become effectively take me, you know, Anywhere that's because the, why? Because the marginal cost mm. of that transport is zero. So that you know, once you get to that point of okay, whether through autonomy or or whether through micro, which you know shrinks the cost down way down, um, then suddenly it's like, well, mm. the tr the ride is free, but you may not know where you're going because we'll make that decision, you know, for you. So there's there's this question about smiles being more that more than just mm. the thrill of it or the fun of it, which is what Porsche could be selling you now. But rather it's like, hmm, I don't care what the cab looks like, but can you take me to a nice club um, where all the happening cool people are? By the way, you should know something about me and my tastes. Yeah. So I think if we get to that, it's sort of like the internet of- Well, there is a, um, a sort of semi-serious theory that um, bicycles um, reduce birth defects in rural France because you could marry somebody from another village. Um, I I, I please to believe that this is true. I know no this is actually is true. Um, but, you know, when you change sort of modalities of transport, you change all sorts of things. I mean, I was reading a, um, what was I reading? Is reading a sort of an early 20th century detective story for unrelated, uninteresting reasons. And um, you realize, so you had this serious crime committed in a market town. What do the police do? Well, they station somebody at the railway station. And that's basically it. Now they can't leave. Like that's all you need to do. You put somebody in the railway station, and there's two roads, and that's it. Like no one can go anywhere. And if you imagine doing that now, now that wouldn't make any kind of a sense. But in like 1910, well, that was it because there were no cars. And then in the early 19th, early 20th century, you have this sort of crime wave. First in Europe, there's something called the Bonnet Gang, Bonnard Gang, I can't remember, which is a gang of basically anarchist terrorists in France uh -huh. who steal cars, which of course have no 
locks at the time. They steal cars and they have magazine, they have um, rifle, military rifles, and they go basically on a sort of a, a, a sort of terrorist killing spree in cars. And the police are like, this is like a completely new thing. They don't. It's like live streaming terrorists now. They don't want, like it's, they've got to work out what to do about it. You get the same thing in um, the twenties in America with sort of Bonnie and Clyde and all of those kinds of people. Again, it's motor cars. Um, and they drive from state to state yep. and the police, there's no cross state um, law enforcement and they can rob a town and be 50 miles away that afternoon. And like the whole law and sort of structure of law enforcement isn't set up to deal with that. And I think there's all sorts of ways in which like the, 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 the transport, when you get these new transportation systems, the same thing obviously happened with mobile phones. The same thing has happened in the last couple of years with social networks. Um, and what do we do? What does it mean to moderate content on social networks? When you get these new tools, like all sorts of stuff happens that you weren't expecting, some of which is good, some of which is bad. And then you need to work out how to deal with it. Let me, we have a few more minutes. Let me try to get some questions answered here. Um, one early question was, what do you think would be the technologies that are gonna impact micromobility most in the next few years? Any, any um, thoughts on that? So I feel like we've got like, there's batteries and connectivity like those are like the core questions. We're then clearly sort of last year, this year, having a social moment around um, changing attitudes to creating streets that are sealed off for bikes. So, you know, Paris and London and places. Mm. Is that a technology? Not really, you know, depends what you mean by technology, but it's the changing attitude to the infrastructure that you should have and the changing attitude to what's possible. Um, I do like the observation that people spent sort of 20 years messing around with new form factors, you know, Segway and hoverboards and scooters. And it turns out, no, the answer is just have a bicycle and put a bad motor in it. And that's actually the thing that you need to do. I don't mm. think there's another technology that we're sort of waiting for to work um, that would change the viability of electric bikes. Mm. I think it's more, I mean, the price will carry on going down, of course. Um, I think it's more like now commercialization and, um, the engineering of the thing and the engineering of the city. Mm. Yeah, and on that question of city and plant and infrastructure, uh, Jesse asked this question, how does Benedict think of the potential as road space slash infrastructure as a platform? Sorry, how, what does he think of the potential uh, of these as platforms, congestion pricing, charging stations, et cetera, where is the intelligence? Um, where, where the intelligence is at the endpoints. Do you think that there's sort of a So I think there's certainly sort of, here? you know, dyna things like dynamic routing, dynamic road pricing. Um, I mean, you could imagine in a world of fully autonomous vehicles that you can choose the cheap route or the expensive route, like almost in real time. And, you know, the city could say, no, you have to go down that road now. So you could imagine all sorts of sort of dynamic real-time routing, dynamic real-time charging, at least sort of theoretically. Um, you can cert I think, you know, certainly, we, you know, we already have, you know, in London and I'm sure other places, um, all fully automated road pricing. So, you know, number plate cameras work out which cars go down what street and you get a bill. Um, you get charged or you're not, you're told what you can and don't do. So I expect all sorts of that sort of stuff will happen and we almost won't know, we won't think of that as technology. You know, it's just like normal, you know, that's just, that's not technology, that's just a database. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, I, I, I'm on the sort of skeptical side in general of the concept of a smart city rather like smart home. Like, I don't think there's a smart home. I think you've just got things that are connected to the internet. I don't think you have a smart city. I think you have number plate cameras. Hmm. Yeah, it's true. The cities are not the leaders typically in terms of technology development or adoption, and and it's been true for a long time. Um, uh, one more question. John MacArthur asks, to, to achieve societal goals, we need to shift people's behavior. What is hard, or which is hard and takes a long time under normal conditions? How do we accelerate shift in behavior? You mentioned, for example, in the beginning that um, the COVID crisis gave us an opportunity to break habits. Uh, do you think that this is something that's going to actually return some permanent behavioral change to the to the transport industry? I know some cities are assuming this. Uh, you know, famously, Paris has kind of become kind of the um, the most uh, the most bike friendly city compared to what it used to be, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's I ironic because Paris this. also has a fantastic metro system, um, like a station every hundred yards of a central metro central Paris. Um, 
I mean, look, everyone, you know, if there's no traffic for 18 months, you can do whatever you like in the streets and then you find out what works. I mean, you know, then we may discover like mm -hmm. there's horrible traffic jams and they have to wind back. I have no idea. I have no view on that. Um, there's a, there's clearly, there's the moment of no traffic that lets you do all this work. There is, and there's also um, the whole work from home conversation, which we sort of alluded to several times. I don't think we really know what work from home means. Um, you know, there's sort of a sm relatively small number of maximalists who sort of think, right, we're going to have global distribution companies from now on. I think many more people think, yeah, you're kind of going to go into the office two or three days a week, maybe four days a week. And that's going to vary a lot by the kind of company and the kind of job and, you know, um, all sorts of, you know, we don't know what that's going to look like. There's clearly consequences for that for um, transit systems both in the loading and in the, the revenue, frankly. Like if you're, you've got to, you know, if you, if you have, you know, 20% fewer fewer travelers on a train system, what does that do to the financial model? Do you run fewer trains? Like what happens? Do you just run, is it okay if you just run fewer trains? What does that mean? Um, and that's not easy to deal with. It is also a big deal for retail and restaurants. Like if you're going into work four days a week, that's 20% less footfall for the local restaurants and the local retailers. Um, so there's a lot of like second order consequences to this stuff that I don't think we quite understand yet. We only have about one minute left. Just a quick parting question here. Um, you're an investor now or have been for a while. Um, do you look at this sector very much or are you sort of, um, you know, uh, I'll see it if uh, I'll, 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 I'll love it if I see it kind of. Yeah. So, you know, you know, venture investing is one of many economic models and it requires a certain kind of company with certain capital requirements a certain kind of potential outcome and so you know if you need five billion dollars and you'll probably make six that doesn't work for venture capital you know the venture capital model is no we're going to give you 10 and then 20 and then 30 and you'll make two billion um and so you know that's a very small subset of all the companies that can be created and all the things that can get built and you know right now you know i'm a venture partner at mosaic which is a seed and series a fund you know they don't have the money to for you to build a nationwide Doctor's bike system, like that's a billion dollars. They didn't have a billion dollars. Um, so I think, you know, there's a huge difference between what's a great model and what or a great company and what's a good venture capital investment. Um, and, you know, A16Z invested line bike, in line bike, which is obviously had a horrible 2020. Um, that was sort of right out at the edge and A16Z is a big fund. Um, otherwise, I would sort of point to like great, but not for us in general. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some low capital models out there, not just, you know, needing huge amounts of, uh, of equipment out on the field. Mm -hmm. There there are some software plays out there. But, but fair points. Um, I think that's our, our time.